excited about hearing her talk. Uh, please welcome Dr. Larisha Hawkins. Just thanking you and blessing you back. Um, I've entitled my remarks today, The Power of Rhetoric, an Imagery That Leads to Suffering, Not Solidarity. So the theme of this conference, in case you're unaware and didn't read the program as you were called, is the power of rhetoric and imagery. At times in our lives, we all need solidarity. Not solidarity from afar, not thoughts from a distance, but people who are willing to sit in the mud and the muck. People willing to be soiled with the stains of suffering with us in the trenches. When we suffer, our whole being suffers. Our body, our bones, our heart, our soul. Our spirits are tested. As for me, I cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in the valley of the shadow of death? And in the next breath, I aver that I believe, but I need help for my unbelief. Holding on to hope, yet not relinquishing doubt, is impossible without solidarity. As a political scientist, though, what strikes me about suffering is that while suffering resides in individual bodies, yours, mine, my little hijabi friends, suffering takes root in entire groups of bodies, bodies clustered around a common injustice, whether inequality, racism, sexism, genderism, ableism, heterosexism, or Islamophobia. Believe me, these little girls' bodies already bear the trauma that is the American narrative in their little bodies with a headscarf. They're brave. These are the oppressed, those that in my own faith Jesus came to liberate from suffering, from their bodily, material suffering in the here and now. Not just spiritual liberation, but bodily liberation. Not in some eschatological future where there is no crying or pain, in the socio-politically charged present. Religion, theology, philosophy is always contextual. It is transcendent, yet space and time bound, seeking truths of the universe, yet acknowledging the effed up nature of the world past and the vaporous present that sometimes feels vacuous, like a hell hole of suffering. The power of rhetoric and imagery, religious, political, civic, Familiar, familial, is that they employ devices with which we tell fantastical stories, weave national narratives, invoke martyrs and saints, and whereby we create the other. The other is usually the foil in these narratives, if not the outright enemy. I want to challenge you today to embrace the fact that the bodies, the very lives of black Americans, queer Americans, Native Americans, Arab Americans, and ostensible Arab Americans are in grave danger due to religious narratives and public narratives that have a basis in a larger national narrative of what it is to be an American. I said Arab Americans specifically, not merely Muslim Americans, because a Palestinian Christian was murdered in my home state of Oklahoma because his, his ethnicity made him a marked man, a crosshair on his head. He wasn't killed in random violence. He was killed by his neighbor, the man next door. He was killed while talking on the phone to the police about the fear of his neighbor, whom he learned had purchased a gun the day before. The same neighbor who had run over his mother while she was out walking for exercise in their neighborhood. Tire tracks on her body. Lest you chalk all this up to Hickville, USA, this happened in one of the two largest cities in Oklahoma. Cosmopolitan cities, we like to think. Why? Perceptions of Muslims. Perceptions of the other. We have a perception problem in the U.S., not a heart problem. Racism, xenophobia, fear of the stranger, Islamophobia, and on and on. And let me tell you, as an aside, I want to take the emphasis off of the heart, because good Christians and good Muslims think that, you know, if we just convince people that we're nice, if we just convince people that it's not okay to hate, 
that everything will be okay. If we over-spiritualize racism, the original sin of the American Republic, yes, that's true. But it's a way of also distancing the problem from systems and structures in which Islamophobia, racism, sexism, and other isms replicate themselves over and over and over on our watch in our policies, and yes, in our religious institutions. So I want to take the emphasis off of the heart talk, because I'm tired of it, because it ain't working. So that's why. I want to do that aside. That's not in the script. Sorry. As a professor, OK, a problem with how we see, whom we see, what we see. As a professor of political science, I was concerned pedagogically, that's the methods we use to teach, with how to get my students to see suffering bodies and to move beyond their privileged paralysis when they do see those bodies, right? To embodied solidarity. I told them over and over that our theoretical solidarity, our solidarity up here, the sadness in our heart, our fist raising, Facebook liking, head shaking, check writing, blog writing, social justice crusading from afar, ain't cutting it. Theoretical solidarity is not solidarity at all. As a human, who happens to be a political science professor, in December 2015, I was concerned and grieved personally about a country that masquerades as the beacon of human rights in the world and whose presidential politics have devolved not to pandering, but to blow hard buffoonery that propagates and elevates the hate that does reside in people's hearts and that remains systematically ensconced in our structures. Hatred toward black, brown, gay, Asian, poor, rich, Muslim. Yes, I will keep repeating those oppressed groups because we need to be convinced. I was concerned about presidents of colleges named after what the country of human rights purports to spread across the globe when we indiscriminately kill babies with drones and call it collateral damage. The president of Liberty University imploring his students to exercise their liberty to, quote, end those Muslims before they kill us, end quote, sign up for gun classes after chapel service, read religious service that every student is required to go to, sign up and get your gun permits and your training right here on our Christian campus. That's the world my nephew gets to inherit or the babies that a mom showed us gets to inherit? How does this happen? How does it happen that media elites exacerbate a narrative of white Christian supremacy? A white supremacist Jesus. How is it that even, uh, wrapped in a flag, by the way, how is it that even black presidents extolling the virtues of middle classness miss the fact that middle class virtues are a euphemism for white Victorian values? that writes off the cultural and indigenous values that racial, ethnics, and untraditional families hold. Quite simply, oh yeah, I'm equally like mad at Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians and everyone else, so I'll offend all of you at some point. Quite simply, the national narrative around citizenship is that to be a citizen, to be a president, is to be white. To be Muslim is to be not American. To be a presumptive Muslim because you once lived in Indonesia. To be a socialist, which is un-American, right? McCarthy taught us that, I guess. Show, I was like reading my slides, show Terrence Crutcher. I forgot to put Terrence Crutcher in. To be Arab Christian is to be a bad man. To be Terrence Crutcher on the way home from community college in Tulsa is to be a big bad dude up to no good. It's to be dead. It's to be a justifiable, justifiable target of a mosque burning in Columbia, Tennessee. Or I should say bombing, more appropriately. Or a black church massacre, execution style, in, Char in Charlotte. The city is burning because the national narrative has never truly embraced bodies that are different, that are not white. It is. And of course, the national narrative has allowed some of you immigrants to become white. That's racial formation in the United States. That's a class you could take with Dr. Hawkins at some point, or with your own professors. But it's important to know that our national narrative is one of making people white when it's convenient to do so. It's utterly incoherent 
and illogical that nationalists and patriots want on the one hand to hold on to the ideal of the great American melting pot or salad bowl, the openness of a society of strangers, foreigners become friends over a 250 or so year history, yet on the other hand, revolt Tea Party style when they see the diversity actually unfold. Let me share with you the price of images and narratives. When on December 10th, 2015, I felt called to wear a hijab in solidarity with my Muslim sisters, sitting at home that day, pinning a Facebook message, I said something along these lines. I don't love my Muslim neighbor because he or she is an American. I love them because they are imbued with human dignity. Because we come from the same primordial soup. I crawled in the cave in Sturkfontein, South Africa, from, which, from whence we all arise. Muslims are my sisters and brothers. And, as an aside, I said, something that I thought was intuitively obvious, we worship the same God. And I invoked the name of Pope Francis, because Pope Francis had been in the Central African Republic a couple of weeks before, evincing solidarity with Muslims, because they were being attacked by the Christian majority in that country. A flame in civil war. Most of you don't even know where it is on the map, right? So, what happened was at the end of the email, I invited my brothers and sisters into a narrative, but especially my sisters, of embodied solidarity with women in the hijab. December 10th, as you will notice, is Christmas time on the Christian calendar. It was Advent season. Advent simply means to come, to wait with anticipation for the birth of Jesus, whom Christians believe is incarnate, the incarnate representation, the bodily representation of God, God with us. And I thought, like the Lenten season, where Christians often give up or take on new responsibilities in anticipation of the resurrection of Christ, I wanted to use my Advent season as a form of religious devotion. As a professor, it's easy to lose sight of the season, because I'm always grading. And so this was, my, this, was, this was personally a faith commitment. It was also a professional commitment to live out what I just told you I preached to my students. Theoretical solidarity is not solidarity. It's Larisha Hawkins' religious privilege to put on a headscarf in the morning for my classes to model to my students and then take it off when I get on the train to go home. It's actually not hard to wear a headscarf in the suburbs of Chicago because the Imam said earlier, that's one of the enclaves that Muslims retreated to when they moved to the uh, Chicago area, the Northwest suburbs. It's not hard to wear a headscarf for the most part um, in the suburbs of Chicago. What's more difficult is to wear it at your Christian college, on the airplane home, to wear it in the grocery store, to wear it at your Christian church on Sunday morning. And this was inspired, I must say, by a student who wanted to wear the hijab home on the airplane. And we, um, I hasten to add, we sought the blessing of the Council on American Islamic Relations, where I had a good friend on the board. Um, and the idea was that, well, maybe some of my Facebook friends We'll see this and go, oh, Laurie's just crazy, but some of them would do it because they love me out of solidarity, right? Um, what happened instead was that it blew up beyond what I, I, I could never have imagined, right? That the, the intent was maybe 10 women would wear the hijab. And um, so when the, the rest of the story is kind of that this went viral, the Facebook post went viral, um, and I don't, it's weird when people say the rest is history. I don't know what else to say, right? The rest is I worked at a Christian college. I no longer work there. Um, the rest is I was the first African-American female tenured professor at Wheaton College in its history. It was founded, by the way, as an abolitionist college. Um, and the irony, so the irony wasn't lost on someone. Um, but. <laughs> In any event, um, 
I think that this was not something I chose. I had a conversation with Nahed about some things you don't choose. They just choose you. This was not a planned... Um, it's not, it was not a planned activist act like climbing the flagpole in South Carolina to dismantle that symbol, that image of racial hatred to most of us people of color, right? Not forsaking the history of this country. And so what is though a symbol of my intersectionality and the, and the question of suffering with I've been told that it wasn't, you know, really it's not the fact of putting on a headscarf that's so offensive. Some people are offended that I would dare, in the Christian community, that I would dare to call Muslims my brother and sister. That was the offensive part in this day and age. But I was reminded by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, back to the script, sorry, to walk a mile in my neighbor's hijab. Choosing to subject myself to the denial, possible denial of civil liberties and bodily assault that my Muslim sisters who don the hijab suffer was not religious sacrifice. It was just embodied solidarity, placing my body among the oppressed. But in this political landscapes, Muslims are the political zombies du jour. So many Christians scarcely winced as a fellow Christian instigated the murder of Muslims and instead of walking with Muslims in their distress, asked me why I wasn't standing with persecuted Christians in the world. Because to stand with Muslims means I'm not standing with persecuted Christians. You can't do both. Why would manifold numbers of Christians excoriate me for standing with my Muslim sisters? Why would they be angry and call me a non-Christian for daring to call those little hijabis and their mommies, and my non-headscarf-wearing Muslim women, my sisters, because our eyes are not open. We refuse to see the oppressed as fellow humans on a journey and decide to see them as political spectacles instead. Our vision problem, though, is ultimately a body problem. Our moral imaginations are too small and too decrepit. We've made peace with the oppression of bodies for so long. We are more enamored with narcissistic, hyper-individualistic, and materialistic pursuits, e.g. the American dream, to drive a car nicer than your neighbor, to send your kids to the best schools, read no blacks or Latinos, than we are with seeing oppression in others and in ourselves. Because that's what the best schools are, right? Let's just be real. We categorize entire groups of oppressed bodies as problems not by the structural factors and inequalities that our policies create and perpetuate, often the categories and labels affixed to these groups blame them for their suffering. Welfare queens. We fail to see them. More often than not, we refuse to see them. We go out of our way to avoid them. We ostracize them, relegate them to the margins of society and the peripheries of our political community. Yes, we may briefly be appalled to learn that lead-laced water in Flint or food deserts force kids to shop for their breakfast at the corner store on the way to shitty institutions that are run like prisons, replete with guards and counselors ready to call the popo on eight-year-olds whom they've decided will end up in prison sooner or later anyway. So much for the great equalizer, education, and its farcical twin, the American dream. So, we create zombies of eight-year-old black boys on the south and west sides of Chicago instead of seeing them as babies, the most vulnerable of the oppressed. So 16 shots and a cover-up is easy, and no one blinks until you f YouTube prophesies the truth. In short, we have lost human dignity. We don't see vulnerable and oppressed individual bodies, so we certainly fail to see how oppressed bodies inhere in these groups that I talked about earlier. We relegate First Nations to reservations while we rape and pillage their land and blame them for their community's problems. We see groups of humans as targets to be locked up for life. While this neat world needs people more interested in being prophets than making profits, embodied solidarity goes beyond raising prophetic voices to a power structure that usually only hears special interests. This world needs more than elites and privileged politicians and policy wonks and pastors and preachers and, dare I say, nonprofit community activists to create programs based on their misunderstanding of the plight of those whose voices we don't hear anymore because we don't see them. 
or have been forgotten because their bodies seem okay on the surface because the government throws them half a bone every month so they can still die of diabetes because they can't afford their meds anyway. This world needs embodied solidarity. Since, as I said, suffering takes our whole being, so does solidarity with suffering. Solidarity is just suffering with with our bodies, and this requires moving from comfort zones to war zones. This means utter abandon to being radically for others who have been counted out, written off, and killed off by the state, by us, by our intransigence. In short, we need to develop our collective human consciousness. As the millennials say, we need to be woke. <laughs> Not as voyeurs of oppression porn, but as ones who privilege the perspectives of the oppressed because their cries for liberation have become our own. As humans united on a journey, people of faith and of no faith, people of all colors and creeds, only with such a posture can reconciliation of human to human and human to the earth begin. Only then can justice abound. How do we meet? Not in the middle. We meet in the places of oppression the margins. We are to come to the table as the disempowered ones, not as social justice crusaders, but as fellow pilgrims seeking to grow in our own ability to see oppression by suffering with the oppressed. But to understand suffering in context, we need to understand that we have nothing to offer except empty hands, hearts open to being devastated by the bodily deg degradation that oppression wreaks on souls, on communities, on the earth. The earth is crying out because our bodies are crying out. We rape the earth because we rape one another. We steal children's innocence by sending them to prisons marked as schools. And that's their assimilation project. Standing in solidarity mostly entails sitting in that messiness and the tension of oppression, not opening our mouths to offer causal theories like culture of poverty and defunct and recycled solutions from ill-informed policies of the past. No presumptions about why oppression abounds. No prescriptions about how to fix it. Like a city at the table. Like getting to know your Muslim neighbor, Nashville. Like coming here so I can offend you. <laughs> Embodied solidarity is political because it makes the powerful and the status quo uncomfortable. Because seeing suffering bodies demands you to demand better from ourselves and from others and from the state. Because the perspective of the oppressed humanizes us and it humanizes our policies. But we have the privilege those of those perspectives because the status quo, I don't know what that means, the status quo can only hear money. Your president included, maybe not your mayor, I had that in here. Ask them why their kids didn't, I really liked her. I was like, I wanna be her friend. Will you be my friend, mayor? Um, ask them why kids didn't go to Chicago public schools, the president and the mayor of Chicago. This was first written, that paragraph for a Chicago crowd. Ask Mayor Rahm Emanuel and President Obama why their kids did not go to public schools. And if you defended them for not doing so, ask yourself why. We need the eyes to embrace human dignity as the first truth, not human rights as the bedrock truth of international law, but human dignity as the bedrock principle of people united by more than global governing bodies, people of one soul, as the imam said earlier. We need to understand that real power comes from abandoning ourselves to the truth that all bodies matter, not the neoliberal way that says the top 1% matter more, therefore we kill the bottom 20% by balancing budgets on their backs. We need to change our posture toward oppressed bodies. We need to chain ourselves to oppression until it ceases. That's what the Jesus I follow did. We need to put ourselves in the midst of that oppression because that's where movements are made. Occupying public space, we're citizens, y'all, beyond simply demanding the deluded in power to care about the disenfranchised. They don't give a damn. We need to privilege the perspective of the oppressed because the suffering know more than the elite that bodies matter. Because suffering brings out that something within you. And you learn that the life that is truly life is in being committed to the common good, not merely building the next hotel downtown with your narcissistic name emblazed so large that it makes me puke. That's Trump in Chicago. It's ugly. It's hideous. Embodied solidarity means walking with the oppressed rather than speaking for them. 
It means shaking the dust off your feet as they are deemed without honor in their own homes because your family could reject you, your own workplace because your profession could reject you, your own cities, your own country. It means standing to the death because death always brings life. It means being motivated by that which is within you, whether that is a secular human consciousness or a faith consciousness. And that kind of embodied solidarity is the stuff peaceful resolutions are made of. Thank you for inviting me here today. <laughs>